Z. So I'm Kent Lee, and as you can see, I'm not Korean. Actually, I'm Chinese. Uh, no, not really. Uh, Lee is also an English word. You can find it in the English dictionary. Uh, my ancestors came from the UK to the US hundreds of years ago, 17, 1800. So Lee is English and American also. Uh, in fact, if you go to England, there are a lot of people with Lee as a first name or last name. Uh, and it's less common in the states where I'm from. I'm from Illinois and other places. University of Illinois. <coughs> uh, I'm, you can call me Professor Lee, Dr. Lee. If you want to be more formal, you can call me Your Highness, Your Majesty, Your Holiness, <laughs> and such. Uh, so today we are starting our series for this semester, the EMI series. Um, Number A1, Strategies for Academic English, and this covers a lot of general territory. Some of this we'll go into more specifically in some of the later workshops. Next week is also kind of a general um, seminar uh, about professional development and uh, finding jobs in the big bad world. And uh, later seminars will expand more on some of those themes. What's that? Uh, Okay, this is the website. Usually every week there is a main handout, a main handout which I will usually link up about a week beforehand or at least five days. And usually there's some extra handouts for your fun and reading pleasure too. We've made, it, we've made them available today, but usually you need to print out um, the main handout and any other handouts that you want. And every week I'll be talking from the main handout, which is the one today called Strategies for Academic English. So, let me come over here. I love remote mice here. Okay, so, uh, you saw these before, A1, the kind of general ones. After that, in a couple of weeks, we start this module having to do more specifically with teaching, teaching skills, and also professional development. They have a hand mic coming, okay, good. Um, the next module has to do with speaking and presentation skills. This will be useful for teaching or for other kinds of jobs in the future where you have to do public speaking. Uh, then we'll do uh, a few on writing and academic writing, professional writing. And finally, the practicum series, the small group workshops, um, probably around midterm time before or after, and near finals, micro teaching. Now, as um, my colleague has uh, explained to you, the um, application for the certificate will open on Monday. And it's not a teaching certificate, of course. It's more of a certificate of completion. But it's like certificates offered by teaching and learning centers in other countries, particularly North America. Uh, and it's something that looks good on your CV. Now, if you're not sure that you can finish all of the certificate requirements this semester, that's okay. Don't, in that case, don't apply. If, you're, if you think that you can, go ahead and apply. But if you, th if you can't, uh, you can apply next semester. You can go ahead and attend the seminars this semester. And then if you like it and you want to do more and do all of the certificate requirements, you can apply next semester. And there's, there's some other assignments involved too, some writing assignments involved with the certificate program that are spelled out in the handouts. So let's move on to today's talk, Strategies for Academic English. I'm going to talk about, briefly I'll talk about the differences between general and academic writing, but we will expand on these more in the later seminars. Um, and oh, was, I, was I doing that? Um, we'll also talk about your strategies for planning your projects and your work and your writing assignments and second language issues. Sorry, I'm. This is mostly uh, second language learning issues that you encounter and why you have difficulties doing your coursework in English and what strategies do you need to use to better use English for academic purposes. So we'll start with uh, overall structure and style. Um, in your English education, you may have um, been force-fed or spoon-fed a lot of English, but oftentimes 
you're not aware of maybe what's academic, formal style, and what's not. And that's uh, one problem. And if you're new grad students, you may not be used to the style of writing in your field, particularly the style of English academic writing in your field. Um, there are a number of differences. There are, uh, there's an extra handout. But basically, it boils down to this. <coughs> in English or Western academic writing in particular, um, there's more of an emphasis on persuasion. You're trying to persuade people to your point of view. Uh, even scientific writing is persuasive in a way. Now that's different from the typical traditional Chinese Korean style of academic writing in the past. And particularly if you're from a humanities background, you still may be influenced by that. Where in Chinese and Korean academic writing in the past, there is more of an emphasis on making a connection with the reader uh, out of this Confucian sense of social harmony. But in Western, especially English academic writing, the emphasis is on persuading the reader uh, and arguing your position. And even if it's a science paper, you're doing this. You're trying, you're basically, you're explaining to people, this is a cool experiment. We found something cool. We found something, and this is a good result, and, or this confirms our hypothesis. So even science writing is persuasive. And so because of that, there are certain formal structures that are different from general writing. <clears throat> you might have learned general writing, but not academic writing. Um, there are differences in the overall genre and style. Um, your, your particular field probably has a very fixed style and genre. Uh, that's different from other fields, and that's very different from other academic writing. Uh, especially in science and engineering writing, there is a very rigid structure, even uh, psychology and sociology and, and such. There is a very rigid, fixed structure. This is how you write an academic paper, uh, like an introduction and uh, your experimental design, your statistical results and analysis, and then discussion. <coughs> and such. Um, there are more complicated sentence structures, uh, more subordinate clauses, what do you call it, subordinate clauses, and longer sentences than what's common in general writing, more formal vocabulary. And a problem you may have is you may not be, you may not have been taught what vocabulary is formal and what is not formal. Uh, and that's one of the problems with the traditional style of teaching English uh, here in Korea. Introductions, uh, for example, are different from traditional Korean Chinese writing, and they're different from non-academic writing. Where in English academic writing, we get straight to the point. Uh, we don't have kind of very general introductions where you're trying to connect with the reader and make the reader feel good, like in general writing or traditional Korean Chinese writing. Uh, we get straight to the point, we go straight to secondary information, background that's specific, that leads to your main thesis, your main point. And likewise, topic sentences throughout the essay or the research paper are very specific, very structured. And we'll talk about some of this later on in the future seminars in the writing components. Um, Verb choice, grammar, there's certain kinds of verb choice that are preferred in writing in your field. Active and passive voice, maybe modal verbs and such. Passive voice is quite common in academic writing. Uh, a certain verb tense might be preferred in the academic writing in your field uh, or in certain sections of a paper. In academic papers, in certain sections or certain fields, maybe present tense is preferred uh, for describing, describing and discussing uh, general truths, things that have been established as true, or theoretical discussions where you use the simple present. You might use the past tense when reporting uh, past research, or you might use the perfect tense like have, discovered, in certain cases when you're talking about recent research that connects directly with your own. Thank you. Oh, and a wire too. Oh, I can pull you and trip you. Okay, or trip myself. Now you can hear me. <coughs> um, and there are a number of grammatical styles and features um, that are unique to academic writing and unique to your field of study, perhaps. Uh, 
And so there's a certain specific purpose, re uh, rhetorical goals. Rhetorical means you're trying to persuade people through your writing, through your speaking also, when you're doing presentations, class presentations, conference presentations, uh, job talks, if you give a job talk, a uh, job interview, it's also persuasive. You're trying to show how smart you are, how knowledgeable you are, and you've got something really good, some really good experimental results that are worth talking about. Uh, and there's a certain authoritativeness you're trying to project, especially in the English academic culture. A certain authority you're trying to project. Um, you're not trying to show that you're um, necessarily humble in trying to connect with the reader or listener and make them feel comfortable. Uh, there's more of an emphasis in English academic style on projecting a sense of authority and confidence in the way you say things and the way you structure things. And we'll get into more of those specifics in the later seminars on presentation skills and writing skills. Um, big problem though is your planning processes. So let me ask you some questions here. There are some questions like this in your handout. Uh, I'm going to have you discuss this for a few minutes, maybe with the people sitting next to you. When you have maybe a major assignment, maybe it's a research paper, a term paper, an essay, uh, to write or uh, a major presentation to do. How do you get started? How do you do the planning process? Do you just sit down on the computer and just start typing? Does that work for any of you? Maybe when you're really good someday uh, you might get to that point but probably not yet. Um, probably not. How do you get started? Um, do you uh, have to have uh, uh, a quiet background, do you, do you need some noise or music in the background, library, home, coffee shop. More importantly, um, what's your strategy for getting started? How do you generate ideas? How do you get your ideas on paper? Uh, do you use outlining? Uh, do you uh, revise just one time or five times? Uh, how much revision do you do? How, what's your strategy for when you revise your papers or your presentations? Uh, how much do you practice if it's a presentation? How much do you practice and how? Uh, how do you practice? Uh, things like that. Uh, do you sometimes encounter blocks, uh, writing blocks or mental blocks? Uh, so you, maybe you know writing blocks. Maybe you've been sitting at the computer for an hour and you still got one line on the screen, right? That's a writer's block. You, you're, you block, you can't get anything out of your brain onto the paper or onto the screen. You get stuck. You can't think of what to do. Uh, so do you have blocks, mental blocks, writer's blocks? Uh, if so, w what do you do about it? Uh, give up? Drop out of grad school? <laughs> I almost came to that point once, kind of. Uh, uh, well, watching TV, procrastinating. Uh, uh, drinking excessive amounts of coffee. How do you deal with that? Uh, and why do you think you have blocks if you have problems? Why do you think you have blocks? Uh, what do you think causes that? So maybe for a couple minutes discuss with a partner, a neighbor, um, about your planning strategies for major assignments. So talk to each other. <laughs> Okay, I hear the volume dying down a little bit, so it seems like you're nearly done. So, what, what were your writing processes? What were your strategies for getting started, your techniques? Here's some volunteers. Have it in the front. Uh, my strategy is that first of all, I think and then I research on the internet mm -hmm. and I got a lot of ideas and then I, write, I make an outline. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Okay, so a web search is kind of your yeah. brainstorming technique, yeah. which then goes to an outline. Okay, that's that's good. Um, anyone else? How many of you use some kind of a graphical organizer, like maybe a concept map? Do any of you do that, like a mind map? You do. Yeah, sometimes I do. 
Okay, I'll show you an example in a minute if you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, for some people that works, especially if you're more of a visual kind of person, you might like that. Do any of you just write your, sit down and just write out your outline? Do any of you do that? <clears throat> no? What do you do first? Just come up with kind of brand new idea. Okay. So that's brainstorming. Kind of brainstorming in your head. Okay. Uh, do any of you brainstorm on paper? Just write out random ideas on paper and then organize it? Okay. For some people that works. And you'll need to find what technique works for you because uh, some people have difficulty with that. How many of you have writer's blocks? Or other blocks? Okay. Um, how do you deal with it? What do you do? Okay. Okay, here? They usually go out and uh, think like they just, uh, while thinking the idea, mm -hmm. just work and work <laughs> Okay, going out and thinking, okay. That's the point, I go on the internet and search for something interesting that I could use on uh, thinking. Okay, more searching for information. And sometimes that's a good strategy because sometimes you don't have an, sometimes one cause of this is you don't have enough information. Okay. Uh, other ways of dealing with writer's block? Well, mental blocks. <coughs> the previous paragraphs, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, reviewing a previous paragraph. Okay. Does that help you? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> okay. Do you know what causes your writer's block? which works for you. Um, some people need to do it on paper, uh, just free writing whatever ideas come to mind and then organizing it. Um, you might try social brainstorming. Um, maybe you need to get with some classmates and th throw ideas around verbally and use that as a way of generating ideas for your project. Especially if you are an extroverted person, that might be useful or perhaps even more fun. Uh, if you're more introverted, maybe you just prefer sitting at your computer and outlining on your computer or on paper. <clears throat> so socially brainstorming with a group of friends, classmates might be helpful. Uh, this is an example of a mind map. Sometimes you've done some brainstorming. Some people who are kind of more visually, graphically oriented, they might prefer to then organize their ideas into a mind map like this that shows how things are related and connected. Uh, or you just free write random ideas on paper and then try, kind of draw lines and circles to, to group them and connect them or whatever. <coughs> and then from a concept map, uh, you can then turn this into an outline. You can group things together and put those under different categories in your outline. Uh, but it is a very good idea to at least get to some kind of an outline where you have like three to five main points and each of those main points has three to five sub points. Now why is that a magic number, three to five? Why is it good to organize your presentations and papers around three to five main points? In each main point maybe with three to five sub points and so on. What's magic about three to five. <clears throat> well, it has to do with working memory. You know, working memory. How many items you can hold in your memory uh, at a given moment? And for people, it's around five, plus or minus two, three to seven items in your head. But when you're talking about ideas, like in a paper or presentation, complex information, probably three to five is kind of what people can follow uh, logically, what they can hold in their working memory. So three to five things makes it easier for your readers or your listeners to follow, uh, to remember your main points and where you're going. Um, so. <clears throat> that has to do with human working memory and what is easy for people to uh, keep in their minds when they're reading your paper or when they're listening to you. And there are different ways. Some people can do outlines in their head. Some people need to do it on paper. Find what works for you. Some people do it on their 
computer screen at the beginning of their document and then expand on it into their paper. Whatever works for you, you should find. But that's, no matter what planning methods you use, it's ideal to at least get to an outline and use an outline to plan your project. <coughs> now, for Koreans and other uh, ESL, what we call second language learners, L2 learners, typical problems are they don't do enough planning and maybe more planning is needed to do this in a second language and they don't do enough planning beforehand, planning in detail their ideas and how they're going to phrase their ideas and how they're going to try to convince the reader or the listener uh, types of evidence or support in order to support what you're saying. So the support tends to be weak or lacking because um, especially given the way that English was taught to you, you will probably focus too much on little things like grammar and vocabulary and miss the important things, the big picture, um, like uh, making your ideas make sense, making your ideas persuasive, good arguments, good support or evidence for your arguments or for what you're saying, good information, good use of sources. Um, so uh, L2 writers tend to probably spend too much time on minor things like is my grammar correct, is my um, vocabulary correct and such and they forget the important things like are my, I, do my ideas make sense, is this convincing, do I have enough evidence or support, do I have enough explanation or examples to the, give to the reader. Uh, things like that. They get lost in the details. Uh, and then they use, superficial, they use sources superficially. We'll talk about this uh, later on in future workshops. Uh, citing sources tends to be superficial. Maybe you'll do a Google search and go, oh, that looks good, I'll throw it in. But without really meaningfully interacting with that source, reading that paper, uh, or reading more than the abstract of that paper, and then just throwing that information into your paper. Uh, so superficial source use, uh, rather than carefully reading the sources and critiquing them, um, that means analyzing them, uh, talking about their strengths and weaknesses, rather than to say, oh, that looks good, I'll throw it in my paper uh, padding, looks good. So those are some of the problems that you have. Uh, when it comes to writer's block, also problems might be you have maybe too much information or too little information. Uh, too much information maybe if your topic is too big. A common mistake of new writers, inexperienced writers, is picking a paper topic or a project topic that's too broad. And it's actually overwhelming because you don't know how to manage it. And so maybe at first you have a block because it's just too much. Or in the middle of the project or the paper you find yourself overwhelmed because it's too much. And you've committed yourself to a topic that really deserves a whole book rather than a five page research paper. <clears throat> so making your topic more specific or maybe a bit broader. Finding more information, maybe you don't know enough information and you need to find more information so you get ideas. Um, those are common problems of inexperienced writers whether it's in a first language or in a second language. Uh, expectations. Maybe you have unrealistic expectations. Uh, who are you trying to please? In the back of your mind who you're trying to satisfy. Are you worried maybe in the back of your mind about what the professor will think of your paper. You're worried that the professor will think that you're dumb. Right? That's a common uh, problem, especially here. And that's, that relates to the problem of perfectionism. You're trying to be perfect, um, which means you have unrealistic expectations of yourself. And uh, you're worried too much about what other people will think of you. My professor will think I'm dumb. My classmates will think I'm, I'm dumb uh, or that my English is bad. Uh, so people worry too much about this kind of stuff and this creates a block um, and this could come from uh, sources like your past teachers or even parents putting too much pressure on you. Uh, for example, it might be the case that you had a bad teacher in your past, maybe in college, high school, maybe as far back as grade school. A teacher who gave you a lot of discouraging uh, messages, a lot of negative feedback, who discouraged you and made you feel dumb. That could be the source of writer's block because when you're trying to write now, in the back of your mind you've got those messages that you have internalized from 
two years or 20 years ago, basically saying you're not, you're not good enough, you can't do this, you're no good at math, forget it, um, and so plus. So you might have internalized those kinds of negative voices from the past, and you need to think about, um, do you have wrong expectations of yourself or a wrong view of yourself because of negative messages from past teachers or parents? Um, especially in Korea, maybe parents pushed you too hard, teachers pushed you too hard. Um, you have to be good in English, you have to get A pluses in everything, uh, which are not realistic expectations. Uh, only a few people can be A plus students. We'll come back to that later when we talk about motivation. <coughs> so, you will maybe need to think about what process works for you and especially when you're doing it in English, it's harder and it takes more planning and more preparation. You may have to think about what's the source of my writer's block? Do I have unrealistic expectations? When you're writing, you just want to get a draft out. No matter how bad it sounds at first, at first don't worry about what the professor will think. Just get something out and then revise it. So a lot of inexperienced writers, especially second language writers, don't do enough revising. Uh, you need to do more revising. So first you get a draft out. No matter how bad or awkward it sounds uh, in terms of the contents or the English quality, don't worry, forget about it. At first forget about expectations of your professor or classmates and just get something out. Then you go back and revise and try to make it more uh, persuasive, more informative, more coherent, more beautiful uh, through multiple revisions. And so you need to do maybe more revising. Uh, in, and at the later stages of revising, then you can start to think about, okay, is this going to convince the, the readers? Is this going to convince people? Uh, next, we want to talk about, well, some more second language issues, including motivation and strategies. What are some of the language problems that you will have when you're doing work in English, particularly? Well, English and Korean are just very different, of course. Uh, learning a language as an adult uh, is more difficult because around the age of puberty you go through what's, you kind of leave what's, what linguists call the critical period for learning a language. If you're, the best way to learn a language is to be born as a baby in a house where the parents speak the language in a country where they speak the language. But if you can't, and if you're past the, pa the age of puberty, it's harder. Um, it has to do with changes that happen in your brain. There are changes that happen in your brain around puberty, around ages 8 to 12, 13 or so, that make it harder to learn a language naturally. So it takes a lot more effort. Um, and so as a result, there you, you've, it's harder to learn the grammar. Also vocabulary and what we call collocations. We'll talk about these more later in a later workshop, but uh, words that go together. Like in English we say influence on and Koreans will sometimes write influence to, but the expression is influence on. But if you use influence as a verb, we'd say x influences y, not x influences on or to y, but x influences y. Here's another example. If I say, how would you complete this phrase? Salt and... Salt and... Some of you are saying pepper, What's another possibility for some of you? Sugar. The Korean response, the Korean collocation is salt and sugar. For Westerners, it's salt and pepper because of what we have on our dinner tables. Or how about apples and? Okay, apple, Westerners will say apples and bananas or apples and oranges. Koreans will say apples and pears. <laughs> kind of another example of collocations. Uh, and there are just millions and millions of these word combinations. Uh, and it's really hard. You cannot get these from memorizing. And the education system has pushed you to memorize words uh, and to memorize grammar rules, memorize vocabulary. You cannot learn collocations that way, what words are used with what other words. Uh, you can't understand how words are used in context. Uh, because English and Korean vocabulary is really, if you've ever used a Korean English dictionary, I find them useless sometimes because they don't give good translations. <laughs> because of the um, collocation problems and word usage problems, words are just used very differently. 
a different context between the two languages. Uh, and you can't get that from memorizing. The education system here has pushed you too much to memorize words, uh, and that doesn't really work. Um, the best way to learn is through reading. We'll talk about that later. Um, various ESL writing issues that's on the handout, the extra handout. The traditional teaching methods I mentioned, teachers pushing you to just to memorize. It doesn't work. Uh, <coughs> misconceptions about learning. So as a result, students will think, well, if I just memorize, memorize, I can learn English. And again, that doesn't work. Uh, memorizing vocabulary and grammar rules is simply learning facts about English. It's not really learning English. Uh, to really learn English, you need to use it. You need to do a lot of reading, uh, listening, uh, particularly reading, a lot of different readings um, and such. And when possible, use it um, and such. Um, but traditional te uh, learning materials, like those that are popular here, are not very helpful. Um, so there are various misconceptions about learning. Others will think, if I just study harder, I'll learn English. No, it's not true. Or if I have the right kind, of, if I have more motivation, um, that's not true. We'll talk about motivation in a few minutes. There are good kinds and bad kinds of motivation. The bad kind can actually ruin your life. Uh, finally, there's what's called automaticity or mental efficiency. In other words, how automatic the language is. So if you're Korean, if you see Korean or hear Korean, your brain cannot help but to interpret and understand it automatically. But if you are dealing with English, your brain has to work extra hard. Uh, or in my case, uh, if I see English, hear English, I cannot stop my brain from interpreting and understanding it. It's completely automatic. So for you in your first language, understanding the grammar of what you read or hear is completely automatic and subconscious because you have been doing it for decades since you were a baby uh, and you have years of lots of experience. Uh, <clears throat> if you see Korean text, you just can't help but to automatically read it. You can't stop it. You, uh, in my case, if I see German, which is a language I learned in college, um, I'm pretty good at it, but I have to work extra hard in order to understand it. Uh, and sometimes I have to struggle a bit. It's not automatic. Uh, and this is a big problem in a second language. It's going to take many thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of experience in a language to develop some degree of automaticity or fluency so that your brain is more used to it, comfortable with it, and can handle it more efficiently. So right now, if you're dealing with English, um, your brain is not automatically recognizing words and what they mean uh, or the grammar. Your brain is having to work extra hard. Uh, in your first language, it's all automatic. And then your working memory is free to understand the meaning of the whole lecture or the meaning of the whole article or book that you're reading. But in a second language, your working memory, which is here, has to work on the grammar and recognizing words, or at least some of that. And it ha there's less working memory to uh, devote to understanding the meaning. And your working memory is multitasking. It's multitasking, it's working extra hard. And so that's why when you read your articles and books in English, you understand them less well. You have to maybe reread them. And after listening to a lecture in English, you're probably more tired. Or you're probably more tired after trying to write in English. Uh, or read in English because your working memory is working extra hard um, doing what is normally effortless in your first language. Uh, and so there is no easy answer to that. Um, it's going to take probably um, a long time, a lot of consistent regular work every day exposing yourself to English, especially through reading, in order to develop some degree of efficiency. Um, finally, the problem with, um, especially here, is motivation. What's your motivation for learning English? Hmm? How many of you like English? Some of you. What are your majors? Uh, my major is philosophy. Philosophy, okay. Uh, who else? English Okay, that's natural, okay. Uh, how many of you don't like English? Okay. <laughs> What's your major? Psychology. Psychology? Okay. 
<clears throat> that's actually understandable because for one thing, parents and teachers have probably pushed you too hard. There's been too much social pressure here in the English learning system, the English education system. <clears throat> and that really affects how you learn and how well you learn. In psychology, we talk about different kinds of motivation. Uh, and this is going to be different whether you're talking about English or whether you're talking about your, uh, the classes in your research area or other classes that are just requirements uh, and other things that you do. We have a, what's called intrinsic or internal motivation, uh, which means you really like doing something, basically. Then there's extrinsic motivation or external, which means that the ultimate source of motivation is not from you, uh, from within you, but it's imposed from outside. It comes from the outside. Uh, and we'll come back to something that's in between called utility in a minute. But intrinsic or internal motivation, uh, people who say regarding languages have an internal or intrinsic motivation, they're the best language learners because they really enjoy what they're doing uh, and so their strategies are more effective. Their learning habits, study habits are more effective because they do it because they want to. Uh, there are three components to this um, that psychologists talk about. One is autonomy. You do it because you want to. So if you like English, you do it because you want to, you're going to do better in English. You're going to succeed better in English. If, you want to, if you're doing it because you want to do it, not because you are pushed to do it, or pressured to do it, or have to do it. Another one is personal growth. Um, means you, you feel that you're growing, that you're improving, and whether it's English or your particular research area, um, if you feel like you're learning something, you're accomplishing something, you're succeeding, you're, you're making progress, if you feel <coughs> that you are improving in something, you feel better about yourself. And this feeds your self-esteem. And that feeds intrinsic motivation. So if you feel like you're doing well at English, you're going to like it. If you feel like you don't do well at English, you're not going to be motivated. Uh, and for some people, uh, to some degree, a sense of connectedness is, is, is a factor. If you feel like um, your social relationships are growing or going to grow because of English, it could be because you're learning together, maybe you're learning in English together with classmates and you're doing stuff together in English and you th through that you develop friendships, closer relationships, or because you realize if you do well in English you can connect with scholars and at conferences and in around the world and develop professional relationships and friendships or if your boyfriend or girlfriend speaks English well and you, you two communicate in English for some people that actually works. Uh, so these are the factors that lead to intrinsic motivation which lead to better study habits uh, and this is true whether you're talking about English or your research area or whatever. External motivation is when the motivation is not from inside you, ultimately. You may have internalized it. P people may have pushed you and you've kind of adopted it, but it's not ultimately from you. It's from the outside world, from maybe parents and teachers pushing you. You have to do well in English, you have to do well in English, and you have to get into Harvard, which is nonsense. <laughs> Uh, Ivy League schools are not that great for us Americans. We don't care if you're Ivy League or Illinois or Pennsylvania. Um, uh, obligation. If you, sense, if you feel like you have to do it. That's discouraging, ultimately, demotivating. Uh, if you feel like you have to do it because other people expect you to do it or other people expect you to do well, not because you want to. And finally, perfectionism. So, Do you think perfectionism is a good thing? No, why not? Okay, it leads to frustration. Okay, how about the rest of you? What do you think? Perfectionism, good or bad? Now, people could be perfectionists for different reasons, having to do with childhood, or here, especially in Korea, because of the education system. Again, teachers and parents pushing you too hard to succeed. You have to succeed. And you internalize those messages such that your self-esteem, how you feel about yourself, depends on how well you do and whether you m are meeting other people's expectations. And that's actually uh, ultimately a harmful thing. It might make you succeed for a while. It might make you a very hard worker, a very diligent student. 
and it's pushing you, driving you to do well, to study hard. Uh, so you're kind of in a success mode. But every perfectionist at some point in their lives will come to a point where no matter how hard you try, no matter what you do, you can't succeed. There, you will meet some kind of challenge where you can't succeed. Uh, when that happens, then things change. It's no longer uh, a driving force for success. It becomes toxic uh, because your self-esteem, again, depends on how well you do, your performance. And so if you feel like you can't perform well, people are going to have problems. You might have writer's block because you're worried about expectations, what people will think of you. Uh, or you will procrastinate. Uh, you will engage in avoidance strategies. People procrastinate partly because they're perfectionist and they're worried about failure. And when you're in that kind of failure mode, you might procrastinate, put things off, avoid doing things. Oh, I've got a paper due tomorrow and it's midnight, but I just want to watch TV. Uh, why? Because you're afraid of doing poorly or other people perceiving you as being a poor student or dumb. Uh, defensive strategies, taking an easier course, uh, avoiding a difficult major, uh, uh, <coughs> Various kinds of avoidance strategies people follow when they are perfectionists. Uh, so if you're a perfectionist, you've internalized some expectations. Um, so basically, you've internalized expectations, maybe from other people, about yourself. And you think, oh, if I get to here, then I'll be good. Because a perfectionist has self-esteem issues. And I speak as one who used to have a problem with this. So I know what I'm talking about. Um, you think, oh, OK, if I'm really good, I'll, I can get to up to here. And so your sense of self-worth, whether you accept yourself or whether you think other people accept you, depends on getting to here. Then if you get to here, then you think, okay, but if I'm really smart, then I should be able to get to here. So you try and try and you try to get to here. And you're thinking, oh, if I'm really, if I'm really smart, if I'm really good, I should be able to get to here. Uh, so you get to here. And then you think, okay, but if I'm really good, you see, it just keeps going and going. It's an endless cycle. And they think, okay, if I get to here, then, then I will, people will like me and respect me. But then you, you can't get to here, here, and you fail. And then you fall into procrastination, depression, um, uh, burnout, other kinds of problems. And these are uh, sometimes problems for grad students, professors, uh, people in the professional world. Uh, so perfectionism is, perfectionism is kind of an extreme form of extrinsic motivation. Um, there's examples of perfectionism here, here, yes, yeah, it's, it doesn't really make sense, but it's not rational, but we do it uh, for various reasons. Uh, maybe because of too much pressure from parents or teachers, maybe because we didn't get enough love as children from our parents, unconditional love. Um, so uh, for various reasons, we've internalized those kinds of messages. Uh, finally, there's a, so you might have to think about yourself. Are you a perfectionist? If so, why? Are your expectations reasonable? Actually think about what are your expectations about yourself? Try to consciously think about them because perfectionists maybe have not consciously thought about this. What do you expect of yourself? Uh, do you accept yourself for who you are? What are your kind of deep down expectations for what kind of person you are and how you will succeed? How much success do you have to be to define yourself? Are those expectations reasonable? And where do those expectations come from? Are they your own expectations or are they from someone else? And are they reasonable uh, to adopt as your own? So think about that. Um, and if you really uh, are not intrinsically motivated about English, maybe that's okay because you don't have to love every subject that you study. Um, you don't have to fall in love with English in order to do good at it. Uh, you want to avoid uh, a lot of the really extrinsic kinds of thinking, especially perfectionism, when it comes to your graduate research and your graduate studies especially, or what you do after graduate school. Um, there's kind of a midpoint. Um, we call it utility motivation. It's, it's kind of extrinsic, but in some ways it's kind of like intrinsic. Basically it means, for English, it means that you you don't do English because you feel like you have to. Uh, you don't necessarily love English. 
um, but you don't mind doing English. So it's kind of like a neutral attitude, positive to neutral attitude, where you don't mind English, you don't resent it, you don't do it out of a sense of pressure. You just think, okay, it's, it's, it's cool, it's okay, because it's going to help me to do well in my research. I need it for my research. So if it's kind of a practical, kind of neutral, the positive kind of attitude toward English, that in itself is, is at least a healthy kind of attitude towards English, for using English in your studies, a utility. It's just a tool. That's it. It's just a useful tool. Uh, it's not a burden. It's not something I have to necessarily do really great at. It's just a tool for me to do my work. Uh, if you just embrace English as kind of a useful tool, um, that's probably good enough, healthy enough. And some people, when they embrace something as a tool, as just a tool, as a utility motivation, and they do it for a while, some people actually kind of flip and they develop an intrinsic motivation for it later. But you don't have to. At least have a neutral, healthy, utility motivation towards English. In other words, it's just a tool for me. That's it. <coughs> So, um, finally, uh, based on what I talked about, a few ideas for learning strategies. Uh, we'll talk about a few of these. Where's my mouse cursor? Um, in terms of your English or your studies in general, it helps to kind of monitor yourself, uh, be aware of how you're doing, and what are your goals? Really articulate what are your goals for your studies? What are your goals for what you want to do in life? What are your goals for English? And then how am I meeting them? Uh, so like, w what are some realistic goals I can set for developing my English skills, my English abilities, and doing my work in English? Uh, so kind of setting, thinking about reasonable goals, not being perfectionist, so thinking about your goals and getting rid of goals that are perfectionistic or not realistic. And setting kind of reasonable goals. What's a reasonable expectation for me and using English and developing my English abilities? Maybe for some of you social strategies it might be uh, uh, again social brainstorming in English uh, as well as maybe uh, practicing English with your classmates. Instead of going to hog ones, it's probably more helpful to study English on your own. Uh, because that's, hog ones kind of give you that extrinsic motivation. But if you study on your own or with friends, form a study group to maybe study your homework, do your homework together, and to practice English together, that's maybe more helpful for improving your English writing. And when you write papers, kind of trade your papers with each other and kind of critique your papers or your PowerPoints. Uh, you don't have to hire proofreaders, you can just do that with your classmates, your friends. Uh, form a study group with your classmates um, to work on your homework, your research, and your English skills. Uh, sometimes mentally rehearsing when you're not at the computer, just mentally rehearse what you're going to say at the conference or in your class presentation, uh, or mentally rehearse your outline and how you're going to write and what you're going to say or write about. Um, sometimes there are also, when in some fields you do have to memorize uh, a good deal of information and instead of doing this kind of very mechanical memorization like you're used to, it's better to maybe get a good book like, well this one called the memory book. Uh, I don't know if this is available in Korea, there are others like it though. Um, I've used some of these techniques since I was a kid. These are basically visualization methods and association methods that um, you can use as memory shortcuts, memory techniques. Um, so for example, if I'm giving a talk, I'm going to maybe um, create in different corners of the room kind of visual associations that help me to remember the outline of my talk. Uh, and so in a talk like this, I've got an association over there, something over there that I visualize in the room that helps me remember the first point of my talk, the second point, the third, and the fourth. If you're memorizing lists of things, these kinds of books have some very clever ways of memorizing lists of things, uh, which you can use. And I use these sometimes for memorizing numbers. I learned these back in middle school. Uh, one of my teachers made us learn these, and it was very helpful for doing his biology test, and I've used these techniques since then sometimes. So I mentioned, um, okay, finding methods, like planning methods that work for you, um, study on your own or in groups, because that's a lot more motivating, whether it's the English aspect of your studies or the research 
aspects of your studies or the contents, like your, uh, you know, your biopsychology class or your class in differential equations or whatever it is. Uh, it's going to be more fun if you do this in a group of people, especially if you're an extroverted person. Um, and forming study groups can be kind of a helpful social uh, strategy. Uh, intensive reading for developing your English. So I mentioned the problem of uh, automaticity uh, or mental efficiency. To some degree, doing some intensive reading can be helpful. Um, this is a, you might have done this in Hogwans actually, in your Hogwan classes, and you don't have to pay money anymore to go to Hogwans to do this. Um, this is something you can do, uh, sometimes this is more of an intensive focused kind of method for uh, reading. You might have done it in reading classes. So it might be a particular article, maybe a, a journal article, a scholarly article that's maybe important to you, um, or something that's interesting to you. So it should be something that's interesting to you or informative. Uh, it, a lot of the, the textbook materials you buy in the bookstores, they're really boring. Uh, so a lot of those boring English textbooks, forget them. They're, if they're boring, you're not going to have motivation. Find something, whether it's popular or academic, whatever, and you can do this sometimes. Don't overdo it, because if you overdo this, again, it's not good for your motivation. But let's say you take a, an interesting article, and you read it carefully once to get the gist or the main ideas. Um, then, and at first, don't worry about the words that you don't know. So Korean students focus too much on the words they don't know, and they are looking up everything. Do that later. So first, just read uh, to get the main idea. Then go through again and try to guess the meanings of new words from context. Uh, some words you can guess from context. Technical words, maybe not. But then after that, go through a third time and look up the words you don't know. Then go through and read a fourth or fifth time to, to get a full understanding of that and don't worry about looking up everything and again find materials that are interesting to read uh, maybe stuff in your some of you, you can do this sometimes with your course materials and that's intensive reading and you probably know how to do that from Hogwan classes so you don't need to take Hogwan classes to do this unless you want to develop uh, so maybe Hogwan classes are only good for learning study strategies or study skills or learning techniques. Once you've learned it, you don't need to pay them any more money. Uh, do it on your own. Um, more importantly, especially if you're de developing that uh, mental automaticity, you need to expose your brain to a lot of English consistently every day, every week, year after year. So this takes thousands and thousands of hours, but you can do this on your own without paying money to a Hogwan. You do this on your own. So extensive reading means doing a lot of reading on your own. And you don't try to understand everything. You don't try to look up all the words necessarily. You can learn some words from the context. And that's actually better than memorizing them. Uh, you need to find interesting and informative materials from different genres, different kinds of writing. So from academic stuff in your field to maybe uh, uh, formal but non-academic stuff like newspapers, news magazines, all the way to popular stuff like your favorite novels or poetry or comics even, that's perfectly fine. Um, you need to read a wide range of different kinds of materials um, and it's the reading that will help you develop that mental efficiency over time uh, and also to learn vocabulary. This is the best way to learn vocabulary because you need to learn words from context. You can't really learn from memorizing them from a book. You need to experience them in context and you learn how they are really used in context and what words they are used with. What kind of context is this word good for? Uh, what kind of context goes with this word? Plus it helps you to remember because you have a memory. You remember reading that word in a article or story about this or about that. And that memory of the episode help reinforces your memory. If you just memorize a bunch of words from these typical textbooks, there's no context. You need context to help you remember and to help you learn the meaning and use of the words. And if you encounter words maybe several times, 
then that's actually going to help you to learn it meaningfully. In order to learn new words, you need to encounter them um, anywhere from three to maybe 20 times. It depends on the kind of word and the kind of context. But reading studies show you need to encounter words multiple times in context to actually learn them in a meaningful way. Uh, and so read uh, a wide range of material, academic stuff in your field and in other fields, related fields, all the way to leisure stuff for fun. As long as they are things that are interesting and informative. And so this is probably the primary way to develop your English skills. To get your brain used to processing English and English grammar, English sentences. And to some degree you can also do this with, uh, I talked about that. Uh, to some degree, you can also do this with uh, listening and uh, speaking. Um, probably not as much as with reading, because it, it, uh, it takes more mental effort. But you can find stuff that you would enjoy on YouTube or TED.com. Or um, for academic stuff, what's called OCW, Open Courseware. That simply means universities put a lot of their course lectures online for free. and. Um, the school has one called OpenKU, and um, schools in America have particularly good sites for OCW lectures in many fields, particularly actually Harvard, Yale, Berkeley, Stanford. Um, a lot of those uh, big name schools have really good OCW websites. You can easily Google this and find, maybe if your professor is boring, find an OCW site and find the same <laughs> material by a better lecturer. Although there are some, I've seen like some well, I found one psychology professor, no, not psychology, computer science prof from MIT who is incredibly boring. Uh, but I also found a physics lecturer from MIT who is incredibly interesting, uh, <coughs> who does great experiments in class. So you can find some good stuff online. Again, ranging from academic to fun stuff on YouTube and, uh, or even educational videos on YouTube. There are great educational videos and educational channels on YouTube from Crash Course World History to Number File and uh, 60 Symbols in Physics to uh, uh, Crash Course Chemistry and all kinds of good stuff. Crash Course Literature, uh, uh, Mind Squeeze and all those stuff. Um, to some degree you can do some pronunciation practice with video materials. Again, a video, audio materials, songs, um, as long as it's stuff that you like. To some degree, you can do shadowing, which means you repeat after them uh, to practice your pronunciation and, and speaking. Uh, again, don't do this too much because it can get tiring, uh, but a little bit of shadowing. You just repeat after what the lecturer or speaker is saying. Maybe watch uh, you know, Steve Jobs and just imitate him and repeat after him. On YouTube, you can sometimes get captions on the videos. You can use that for practice your, to practice your speaking. <clears throat> and we'll do some um, talk more about listening, speaking, uh, writing skills in these seminars later. The EAP, which means English for Academic Purposes. Uh, for writing, uh, again, reading is the best thing to improve your writing skills, knowing how learning words and how they're used in context. Um, sometimes when you read a really cool article in your field, just for your own purposes, write a summary of that article. Uh, just for practice, write a little summary somewhere on a, a Google Doc. Keep a running summary of interesting articles you've read. Just write your own summary. This is a way to practice. As well as writing informal stuff, write your own personal diary or journal. Uh, you can do that on a Google document or whatever. Uh, but for academic stuff, write a summary of some you know, interesting papers because later when you're writing your dissertation, that might come in handy. You can say, oh, I wrote a summary of that. It's in my, one of my personal documents. I can work this into my dissertation or into this paper I'm trying to publish in an academic journal. So that's a way of practicing writing. Uh, writing summaries of articles as well as personal writing that no one will ever see like your personal diary journal in English. And then when it comes to academic papers, doing as much revision as you can. So that means budgeting your time wisely, getting started as soon as possible so you have time to do as much revising uh, as you can. And as you start to get some minor research, maybe master's level or beginning PhD level papers, some good course papers or research you've done, Try to write that up and get it published in minor journals, KCI, domestic journals, uh, as a way of 
learning how to do research writing and getting published if you uh, want to pursue an academic career. And we'll talk more about career later. Uh, so those are some tips for strategies. Uh, and that has been our first uh, lecture in this series. Uh, so thank you, and good luck, and don't forget to be awesome. All right.